All right, let's pray. God, thank you so much for your word, for its ability to build us up, um, to teach us uh, how to live as, as humans, Lord, and, and, and how to be Christ-like, loving, caring, um, people of integrity, people filled with truth that love the truth, Lord, um, people with, with courage and kindness. And, and I just pray that you would continue to bring out the fruit of the Spirit in our life, that you would, we would be a fragrance of Christ in our interactions with other people. Um, and I just pray your blessings over this church and over this message this morning, and that, it would, um, that you would preach it, and that it would, it would sink deep into our hearts, and it would, it would change who we are. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. This is either the last or maybe next to last um, sermon in the sermon series, Speak What's Spoken. Um, and I knew one of the things when Jonathan and I talked back four or five weeks ago that had to be in this sermon um, was, was Christ's teaching. And um, this sermon is called The Redemptive Power, The Redeeming Power, and Yes and No. Uh, one of the most um, <laughs> life-changing teachings of Christ is that he, he does something special for his people and that we can be people whose yes means yes and whose no means no. And it's a profound teaching because I think if we take stock of our life, one of the things that we'll find is I think yes and no are the two words that we have a lot of problems with. It gives us, it, it, it's a struggle for us. It's a struggle sometimes for us to hear those words. It's a struggle um, for us to say them. Uh, this is, Let's start with a show of hands, just real quick. How many of you struggle hearing the word no, being told no, with no explanation? Is that hard for anybody? Does anybody have trouble telling the truth here? <laughs> yeah, it's hard. It's hard to hear no. Okay, how, how many of you struggle doing that? Just if somebody asks you something and you just say, hey, hey, no, thank you. And you can just leave it at that. Yeah. Okay. How many of you struggle with yes? With saying yes? Yeah. Then, okay. How many of you struggle with this type of yes? The type of yes that's very impulsive, that doesn't necessarily think the thing through, but the person is asking you, the person that's asking you, you like them and you want them to like you and you want everything to be great, and you want them to be happy, and, and so something comes into your realm, you're asked something, and you say, yes. You don't think about it. And then your yes causes you, I don't know, six weeks, eight weeks, half a month's worth of pain and angst because you're having to live through the consequence of your impulsive yes, and if it's not that severe, maybe it's this. Maybe it's you commit to something, and like a week or three days after committing, you try, try to figure out how you're not going to do that thing. You know, and you start praying for weird stuff, like, Lord, will you give one of the children pink eye? Just one. I mean, it's contagious enough to where if one just gets it, you know, that gets, gives me an out. Or, you know, when the kids, they, they go outside in spring and they cough, they come and they cough, and you go, whoa, you have a, there's a cough. There's a cough here, right? And, and hey, 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 hey. Sutton's got a cough. Yeah, I know. Okay, I'm so, I'm so sorry. Yeah. And, and then it's like, all right, so we're going to Mexican, right? Get the kids in the car. Let's go. We're going to Mexican tonight. Yeah, okay. Or you, you go through with the yes and you, you're bitter about it. You say yes to something and then you go, well, no one appreciates this. I don't even know why I'm doing this, right? And then you just, and, you, and, then, and then you become, and then you, then you complain, right? You agree to it. And then you act, the thing you agree to, you actually complain about the entire time, right? And you just, 
Well, one of the things that, that Jesus teaches us and what, the, and what he died to accomplish for us, you know, because I know we've been talking, it's, it's funny because it's, we all do it as humans, right? You know, it's one of the things that Jesus died to do or to accomplish for us is that when Zeke comes up to me and goes, hey, hey, bro, I'm starting this jujitsu class in Athens and me and my buddy Matt Mason, we're doing it. And what's it, what's it called, Zeke? Athens Jiu-Jitsu, you know, and I think they do che- kids too, right? Is, they teach kids too, it's, so there's a little plug. But when he comes to someone like me and he says, hey, Jeremiah, you know, I got this Athens Jiu-Jitsu coming, well, you know, what do you think? You know, and I, I, Jesus died, so I don't have to go, well, how many? So it's, it comes out of my account every month, is that right? Okay, what's the cancellation fee? Yeah, I mean, oh, man, I'd, I'd, lo- I'd love to do that. And you teach me how to spar and grapple with other men, my weight and size? Yeah, that, that, you know, I can go, hey, you know what? God bless you, brother. I'm going to pray for you. I wrestled in middle school, and I just can't even think about getting on a mat again, ever, right? Jesus died, so you can, you don't have to do it. You know, you don't have to sign up for the monthly car wash thing. The guy at Tidal Wave is going to be okay with you. Right? You don't, you know, you don't have to say, oh, absolutely, I like it. And so where, where, where do I go to cancel it when I leave here? Right? I mean, you can just say no. Or you can say yes. And, and you, or I need time to think about it. Let me, let me think about that. I'll get back with you. Jesus died so that we can actually have enough self-awareness, so we can have enough security in Christ, so that we can be people whose yes means yes and whose no means no. And that's what he's talking about in Matthew 5, 33 through 37. He says, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not swear faultly, but shall perform to the Lord what you have sworn, right? That's everything we've been talking about here. But I say to you, don't take an oath at all, either by heaven, for it's the throne of God, or by the earth, for it's his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it's the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Try this. Be the kind of person whose yes means yes, and whose no means no. That's Jeremiah's paraphrase. But that's the point is, hey, be the kind of person when you say yes, you're not trying, you're not praying for a a virus that doesn't make you too uncomfortable, but enough to get you to 99.1 so you can cancel. Don't be that kind of person. Be the kind of person that actually takes stock of the situation, that, that considers who's asking something from you, who considers your own bandwidth and what you can give in a healthy way. Be the kind of person that takes all that into account and says, can I get back to you? Let me think about it. Or I'm sorry, I can't. Or yeah, that would be, that would be great. And obviously that's a lot more difficult said than done, correct? Because you have to think about it a little bit. Sometimes you got to, you kind of get, you have to get put in positions to where you're, you're confronted by your impulsive yes or your impulsive no, and then you have to set through the thing and then take some stock of all the stuff that's happened and then think through, well, what should I do different in the future? I, you know, that's why I mentioned some things. You should consider the person that's asking the question. You should consider their personality, right? Are they the kind of person that's going to plan properly for a trip? Are they the person that's going to put me and my family in a good situation if I go on this, right? You have to consider all those things. You have to consider the way you feel. And, and sometimes you got to work through that and go, you know, I, 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 I acted in too much haste with my yes or my no, or I didn't, think it, I didn't think it through. And there's all sorts of reasons we say yes, and there's all sorts of reasons we say no that might make the yes or no either a good thing or a bad thing. It's really all relative, but the important thing is that you have enough honesty with yourself and enough awareness of yourself in Christ to say, okay, I can be this kind of person. And, and we're going to give you a couple of examples of that. The first one is in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 12 through 23. And one of the reasons I'm bringing this up, I've got all kinds of personal examples I could use. Um, you know, Beth gave me a list when I told her what was going on of ones I couldn't use. And then she gave me some approved examples that I could use. Um, and I said, I don't really, you know, I don't think I have to go there because I got some biblical examples of this concept lived out and how it relates to Christ and the cross, right? 
The first in 2 Corinthians 1, verses 12 through 23. This is what Paul says. For our boast is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we behaved in the world with simplicity, right? Um, or holiness, and godly sincerity, not by earthly wisdom, but by the grace of God, and supremely so toward you. So, so Paul says that he looks at the, his relationship with a group of people, and he goes, I was, I was really sincere and holy towards them. You know, I, didn't, I wasn't two-faced. That's the one way we would say it. I wasn't double-tongued. I, was, I, I, I conducted myself in a way that my life and my being told the truth about the things that were in my mind and in my heart towards someone else. And this, this is really important because of, of what Paul's being charged with here. He says, we're not writing to you anything other than what you read and understand, and I hope you will fully understand, just as you did partially understand us, that on the day of the Lord Jesus, you will boast of us and we will boast of you. This is a, so there's an attitude and an action there of, of relating to one another that's actually praiseworthy in the day of Christ when Christians act this way towards one another. It's one of the things when Paul, that Paul means when he says, don't lie to one another, except, ex, instead speak the truth in love, right? And so it's a, a really commendable thing when we act this way. Because I was sure of this, all right, because I was sure of this relationship between us and how this all was playing out, and and the way I was acting towards you and the way you understood it even partially, the grace of God and how that relates us to one another. I wanted to come to you first so that you might have a second experience of grace. So we're talking travel plans here, right? This is a Greco-Roman itinerary. I was one wanted to come back and see you guys. I wanted to come over to the Corinthians place and, and just be with you again. That speaks a lot of Paul. You know, go read 1 Corinthians. You might be convinced these are people you don't want to be around all that much, but there's something that's, that's underneath the, even their, their reckless behavior in 1 Corinthians that ties them together. I wanted to visit you on my way to Macedonia and to come back to you from Macedonia and have you send me on my way to Judea. Was I vacillating when I wanted to do this? Do I make my plans according to the flesh, ready to say yes, yes, and no at the same time? As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. This, this is a, Paul, Paul has opponents in Corinth that go, guys, you really think this guy loves you? You were on his itinerary when he was traveling. He didn't even stop. He planted the church and he didn't even stop. You know? And some of you have thought this, Right? You ever plan something for the church and then maybe somebody important in the church didn't show up to the thing you plan? You think, oh man, like, he doesn't even care about what I'm doing. They don't even care about this, right? But we think those things, we're humans, right? And then you get really smart people that know how to play other people and they get in there and go, see, yeah, I care about you though. I'm here. You run from those kind of people. That's just a good piece of advice. The ones that'll substitute themselves for something. That's just wise advice. It never works out. As surely as God is faithful, our word to you has not been yes and no. Paul says, I'm the kind of person whose yes means yes and whose no means no. I don't make plans willy-nilly. Then he says this. For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, whom we proclaimed among you, Silvanus and Timothy and I, was not yes and no, but in him it's always yes. For all the promises of God find their yes in Christ. That is why it is through Christ that we utter our amen, which is yes, to God for his glory. So that's one of the reasons when we pray at the end of our prayers, we say, in Jesus' name, amen is because we're supposed to be the people that have the frame of mind and the consciousness, awareness that, okay, I'm going to God and I'm asking for something, and I'm, what I'm asking for, I'm going to ask for in Jesus' name. So when I say, in Jesus' name, amen, in Jesus' name, yes, at the very end of my prayers, I have a, a statement of faith, a faith-filled yes, amen, 
to all of the promises of God that have found their yes in Jesus Christ. We're basically saying, Lord, I know you're gonna act supremely towards me in love and in mercy and in care and concern. You have said yes to every good thing in my life. You've said yes to everything in my life, how it's gonna work for my good. You've already said that in Jesus. You've demonstrated in Jesus. In, to your yes, I say yes. They say it's a disclaimer of faith. It's a, it's a submissive yes to the things that God has for you. That's why we say in Jesus' name, amen. And it is God who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us and who has also put his seal on us and given his spirits in our hearts as a guarantee. And so Paul looks at the way he interacts with people and the way he says yes and no, the type of person that he is. And he says, okay, one of the things that the gospel frees me to do because of the blood of Jesus Christ is to actually be an honest person. That means I make plans in an honest way. If I don't want to go to Corinth, I don't plan on going to Corinth. See, that's the issue. Is they've taken a fleshly mode of operation of being, which we all fall prey to, right? Where's Pat? He's teaching. We're talking about baseball in the lobby. I'd love to go to F3 with you, Pat. Hard, (laughs) see, really, hard commit, you know. I I would, I I would, uh, sometimes I would say soft commit, you know. I'm going to give you a verbal, you know. Hey, (laughs) let me tell you something. If, If you want some just like, think about college football and the way they recruit players, or basketball, college basketball, right? And they have, they've committed to the University of Alabama with a verbal. Well, if you follow college football recruiting, a verbal doesn't mean anything, right? If you're a human being and you pay attention, a verbal doesn't mean anything either. I've gotten a lot of verbals in my lifetime. Oh, yeah, man. We'll be on the same baseball team. Yeah, you want to do, t- you know, we'll do the travel ball team. Verbal. That's a verbal, right? You know, and that's, and I'm talking about myself here. Beth, Beth gets a lot of verbals from me. A lot of, my wife gets a lot of verbal commitments from me, right? So she wanted to go see Bone and Thugs Harmony. And then like uh, some, some lady named Nellie. And, and she, she's like, do you want to, would you like to go? And I'm like, yeah. It's a verbal. But guess what? That turns into a, that's a national letter of intent I just signed, right? But the world gives verbals. And, and Paul, what Paul is saying here is, in Christ, I'm free from that kind of thinking. I don't have to give a verbal to something I don't feel, that, that's not what I'm going to do. I'm not using you people. I'm not trying to just hang the Corinthians out here and act like I care about them so they'll support my ministry. I don't don't operate that way with you. The blood of Christ gives me a, a, a person of sincerity and of truth, and I can look at you, and I can say yes and no, and I can be free of you having to work through that yes or no and of having to try to please you as you work through it. And I now I can give you some, hey, some qualifiers like, listen, I'd love to be there. I'm not going to be there. Family's got a lot going on on this particular day. I love you, but I can't, right? That's, and that's perfectly fine. You can give those qualifications, right? But, but you know, Paul says, you got to be careful. Jesus says anything more than yes or no is from the evil one. And what he means by that is, is that there's, there's always something behind a qualifier. And most of the time, the thing behind the qualifier, right, is the, th- is the thing that is going to get you in trouble. The thing behind the qualifier is the thing you really need to look at and the thing you really need to work on. It's not the yes or no, it's the thing you put after it or the thing you put in front of it. And what you got to ask is like, why am I putting it there? Why is it there? And, and being in Christ gives us the presence of mind to actually do a little bit of introspection to figure out, okay, is this yes or no coming from the right place? 
right? Because sometimes we'll say yes. Sometimes we'll say no to things. We'll say no to one thing because we're ticked off about a three-week-ago thing, right? And that's not a good no. It's a confusing one. And we'll do the same thing with a yes, with the person in the immediacy of it, right? And we get all these things, we get it all mixed up and people, they don't know what to think. And so what Paul says, take your, Jeremiah says, take your time. Be the kind of person that can actually be like Paul and say, I don't relate to you that way. You have my yes, always. Oh, if I make a plan, you've got my yes. And if you have my yes, then you have my no. That's the point. All right, and so that's one example. And that's the blood of Jesus Christ frees us to do that. It actually encourages us to, it encourages us to do it. And if you're, you know, and, there's all, and if you're a college player that's maybe about to sign something or one day you will be, remember that. The blood of Jesus Christ is, is so precious. It's so precious that you can, you can tell everybody, I'm not sure what I'm gonna do yet. But when you are sure, you can be the kind of person that says yes. And you be a person of your word. And you be the kind of person that says no. And you'll be a person of your word. And that means something. And people look at it. Because it's not normal to be that way. And for Christians, it's a blood-bought privilege to be that way. All the promises of God have found their yes in him. Let's look at another one. Galatians 2, 11 through 21, and we'll be done. This won't be a very long sermon today. Yeah, we're doing great. Galatians 2, 11 through 21. I love this passage here. It deals with a barbecue of sorts, you know. Peter is the kind of... Beth was listening to something on her phone. I think it was like a... Was it a hallelujah roll call? Is that what it was called? You know, something... I don't know if you've ever seen the roll call. You know, then they do that. My name is something. Yeah, no, 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 no. Yeah, right, that. And so it was with the apostles. You know, and Peter was doing his. Well, it was the guy playing Peter, and he was talking about, I'll cut off your ear if you get near Jesus and some stuff. It was interesting. But Peter, you know, bless him. He likes, I think, barbecues. When Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him to his face, says Paul. You know, Paul's something else, man. Like, this dude, he don't care. Like, I've seen, I, I walked with Jesus and, like, you know, I actually denied him three times. So, and, Peter, and Paul's like, you know, I don't care, bro. Like, you act in a way that's just out of step with the gospel. I will, I don't send a text. I don't tell Simon. I'm not going to run to James, you know. Hey, can you try to, he goes right, right to the point. Because he stood condemned. Whew. All right, we got an apostle, a pillar, condemned here. For before certain men came from James, he was eating with the Gentiles. So, you know, Peter's like, hey, arise, Peter, kill and eat. Wasn't so for it in the beginning, and maybe he came around to it later. But when, when, the, when they came, the Jewish people came, he drew back and separated himself, fearing the circumcision party. All right, so as long as it were... You know, the Gentiles were there and the barbecue was going on and there were no Jews there. Peter was yucking it up right there in the middle of, I'm like, you know, life of the party. We were accepted by Peter the Jew. He's living like a Gentile. But when James came with Jewish people, right, things changed a little bit. So if you're a Church of Christ person, you got a lot of Baptist friends and like everything's good, right? Until the people you worship with on Sunday come and you're like, well, all right, why is so-and-so being so weird towards me? You know, if you're Baptist or Methodist, or if you're, I don't know, like maybe a Republican or a Democrat, you know, maybe you are in the church and you're like, you got your Republican friends over here and they're real conservative and, you know, and everybody, everything's great. And then, you know, somebody walks up and, you know, they're not that. And then it's just, you know, everybody's like, hey, how are you? Hey, brother. Hey, br-. that's what we say. Hey, brother. Hey, brother. You know, and then they leave and they're like, you believe that guy? You know? Then he turns into that guy, right? Do you believe that guy? All right, so that's, we do that. We do those kind of things and it, it and, and because that's the way it all works. That's, we're people. 
And the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with him. This is the bad thing about it, right? So that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. Now, earlier in the chapter, Titus is with Paul, and Titus wasn't even um, forced to be circum- circumcised, right? He, he, not even Titus, we're told right here, was, was, was forced to be um, circumcised. And of all the people that should have been, if there was anybody that, you know, in chapter 2, it was, it was Titus, right? Because of his, his ancestry. One of the things this teaches us in Galatians 2 is, is this. Truth and hypocrisy both spread. It's so important, right? So we do not yield submission even for a moment, right? All right, so chapter 2, verse 2. I went up because of a revelation set before them, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. But even Titus, who was with me, was not forced to be circumcised, though he was a Greek. Yet because of false worshipers secretly brought in who slipped in to spy out our freedom that we have in Christ Jesus so that they might bring us into slavery, to them we did not yield in submission even for a moment so that the truth of the gospel might be preserved for you. Right? So he was so committed to the truth of the gospel that even Titus was not forced to be circumcised even though he was a Greek. So the truth spreads. But when you get down here, Poor Barnabas is caught up in Peter's little game, his fear of people game, right? And that's, and that's just good, basic, one-on-one stuff. If, if we're the kind of people that are committed to truth and integrity, it will spread. But if we're the kind of people that are hypocrites, and we form our little circles here, and it could be based on political affiliation, it could be based on age, it could be based on how this person dresses their kids versus it could be based on that will spread too. And so we all have a choice to make. Is what are we going to be? Because if we choose to be it, it'll spread and it'll take fire, it'll take root and we'll be that kind of people. But if we're the opposite kind of people, that will too. So what, what kind of family do you want to be in? What kind of family are you in? Not just, your, not just your church, your biological, what kind of family are you in? And if you're in a family that can't tell the truth, well, you sure know it. Because everybody's skirting around it. And forming sentences the right way. And they're using words to, so that if I put it this way, they'll get the point, you know? Or it could be so bad that you go on Facebook so that the person that you could pick up the phone and call will read it and get the point. And they never do. I've told that illustration a thousand times. You'll get messages from a hundred people who've never offended you saying they're sorry. And the person that really did it will heart it. And you'll think, so (laughs) the rest of the Jews acted hypocritically along with them so that even Barnabas was led astray. That's a big deal by their hypocrisy. But when I saw their conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel, So for those of you who think that this message is frivolous and we're just talking about self-help, how to say yes, how to say no, 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 it's not. This is where the rubber meets the road of the gospel. Paul says, hey, here's the issue here. We're not acting in integrity and it's not in step with the truth of the gospel. That's what's at stake here. It's not about two different groups that come from two different backgrounds and you know those Jewish people, they don't eat anything. Or you know those Gentile people, they eat everything. We're not dealing with that even though it looks like we're dealing with that. We're dealing with the truth of the gospel. And then he says this to Peter. If you, though a Jew, live like a Gentile and not like a Jew, how can you force the Gentiles to live like Jews? He says, in private, your mode of being looks more like a Gentile person than a Jewish person. But when the Jewish people come around, you flip the switch. And the Gentiles that say, oh, he's one of us, they've got an ally on a Jewish person that's like, yeah, I know, I don't know what's up with them. Eating that salted pork. Right, that's what you get. Then he says this. We ourselves are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. All right, so this is what we are. And, And we know 
that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, because by works of the law, no one, not one person, no one will be justified. And so what Paul does is he takes what seems to be this racial, religious kind of thing, and you got Jews and, you know, and they're just, he cuts to the heart of it and he goes, the problem is that we don't understand justification in our lives. We do with our mouth, but we don't understand it lived out. Because what, what segregates people from, from conservative Christians and liberal Christians and Republicans and Democrats and old and young or, or whatever it is, Jew or Gentile, most of the time has nothing to do with the age and has nothing to do with the politics. It's this deep-seated root of law-keeping where we think deep down inside that I am actually justified by thinking the right thing and saying the right thing and doing the right thing. And what that will do is it manifests itself in all types of divisions among people. And that's why you got Calvinists and you got Arminians, right? And you've got Methodists, you got Baptists, and you got all the things because there's this, there's this, this serpent that lives deep in the human heart and it s- whispers in your ear that that is the thing that matters, right? And, and the thing that matters is, is truth and it's an integrity and it's honesty and, and it's And sometimes the things we divide over hide the main point. And what Paul does here is he gets right to the issue of it. Because it doesn't look like justification's in the picture at all, but it is. As Jews, we have freely admitted that the law of Moses cannot give us a, a right standing before Yahweh even though it's been read and remembered and forgotten and recovered and remembered and read again, it will not give us a, a right standing. We've admit, we admit that as Jewish people. And we admit that we are justified by the, by, by the same faith in Christ Jesus as exercised by these people. And so there's a commonality there between the two groups. Namely, faith in Christ is, is the thing that justifies us. Therefore, that's the unifier of the group. It's faith in Christ Jesus. But the issue we're having is that even though we as people know these things and understand these things, we haven't let it permeate us to the point to where it actually shapes the way we act when we're together. And so we're separate now. And it doesn't seem like the issue is justification, but it absolutely is justification. And it has to do a lot, with, a lot more with Christ and what he's accomplished than it does us. If our endeavor to be justified in Christ, we too were found to be sinners because we didn't keep the ceremonial part of the law here. Is Christ then a servant of sin? Well, sir, well no. All right, so it's not that. It's not that, okay. And then he says this. No, no, no. no. This, is, this is how you recognize a servant of sin. If you recognize a servant of sin, not by their ability to bring two disparate groups together, even though they're fundamentally different. Here's how you know somebody that's a lawbreaker. If I rebuild what I tore down, I prove myself to be a transgressor. And that's the issue. That's what their actions are doing. Christ, in his death, he abolished the wall of commandments and ordinances that, was, that were against all people. And he took two different groups of people, God's covenant Jewish people and Gentile people, and he presented them to God in one body, namely his, Christ, right? And what, what, what Paul is saying here is that the, the fundamental issue is that by our actions, we are actually tearing the thing down that Christ built. And that's how you know a transgressor. That's what he's saying. And then he says this, for through the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If I, if I do not nullify the grace of God, for if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. And the, 
So you see the issue here in this little section of Scripture is that there's a conduct that's out of step with the gospel. It's completely out of step with it. And the conduct that's out of step with the gospel is being the kind of person, right, who lets their people-pleasing tendencies say yes when there's nothing but Jewish people around and then say no when the Jews come around to be part of the group. And Paul says that Christ died to take that away. He died to be the great unifier. And when our yes is not our yes and our no is not our no, and we make plans as yes and no, or we, let, we give ourselves over to people-pleasing tendencies or to be liked or to be accepted by one group or another group, we're not living crucified lives. It's not in step with the gospel. And that's really the problem. And so what Paul does in his life, in his, in his teachings, is he takes Matthew 5, 33 through 37, and he actually lives it. Imagine that. And he's the kind of person who says, my yes is my yes, my no is my no. And I'm going to view everything in life through the lens of the reconciliation that is proclaimed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if there are beliefs and ideologies and presuppositions or suppositions that I need to die to so that I can, that I can live with Christ, I become crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I live in the flesh, I'm now lived by faith in the Son of God. And that's what the Christian walk looks like after you become a Christian. Because, you know, we're the kind of people that invite the people we like to our parties. You know? We're not the kind of people that throw parties like Jesus does. When you throw a party, don't buy, you know, don't invite just your friends or the rich or the people that have the ability to repay you. When you throw a party, here's what you do. You invite the poor. You invite the people that sometimes you don't necessarily want to be around. And you don't complain about them when they leave. You don't text the other people that are at the party that you like. And you go, this is why I don't. Can you believe they think this? Can you believe they said? You don't do that. If you can't believe that they think it, go talk to them about it. Imagine that. Imagine how that would work, right? What would life look like? The, the other ways of doing it is out of step with the gospel. That's what Paul's saying. The private text message is about somebody, they're out of step with the gospel. And he goes, hey, knock it off. Jesus Christ died for you to live a life of faith, which means you sometimes you go up and you go, hey, brother, this concerns me, or sister, this concerns me. Now, because something concerns you doesn't mean it's sin. It doesn't mean somebody sinned against you. It doesn't even mean you're right. But it's not about being right. It's not about being wrong. It's about having the presence and awareness of mind that if something is bothering you, you can go to your brother or sister and you can walk in the truth of the gospel and say, hey, this is bugging me. And then the brother or sister in the gospel, they get the experience of having to think through whether or not you're an idiot. Because that's what happens too. If somebody comes to us and they say something we don't like, we go, well, who do they think they are? Well, that's a good exercise to go through as well. Because who do you think you are thinking... Well, who do they think they are? That's the point of it all. And that's how we grow. So we go, okay, well, who am I to think who I, who, who do they think they are? Who do I think I am? Well, that's, that's a good thing to think about, right? Because that's what was all mixed up in Galatians, was who everybody thought who everybody was. And no one gave any thought to who Christ was and what he did, except Paul. And then he took the whole thing and laid it over through the lens of it. And then they were able to see it a little bit better. But that's one of the reasons that Jesus tells us, hey, if something's happened between you and somebody else, go to them. 
Talk to them. Try to fix it. Try to remediate it quickly. Don't let it set. Don't let it simmer. It's because there's, there's a, there's, there are lessons to learn in going through that experience. And most people don't get to learn those lessons. We don't get to go through those experiences. Because if you're like me, I'd just rather cut it off and, you know, we villainize people. We go, well, they were, I knew, always knew they were, they didn't have their head on straight anyway, right? And then you just kind of, well, when, when the conversations happen, we have to have grace in the moment. But then you, you learn a whole lot. You learn a lot about the other person. You learn a lot about yourself. And sometimes you learn those things over time. Because in the moment, you're not thinking about, you know, and this person actually came to me. And this person actually said, hey, I got an issue. Or this, and I really respect them for that, right? That happens afterwards when you're first working through things. Because when you're first working through things, your ego gets involved and, you know, another person's got to have grace too. You're going to go say to some, some you're going to meet their ego. You're not going to meet them. You're going to go talk to them about something. You're not going to meet them. You're going to meet their ego. You got to be prepared to meet their ego. So we, there's, there's all sorts of things we learn when we do these things that actually build up, as Jonathan mentioned, fellowship. They, they build those things up. And we, we actually have that experience. And Christ died so that we could have it. Every promise of God finds its yes in Jesus Christ. Every reconcil- reconciliatory conversation, right? Every yes, every no, every interaction, every time you have to work through the fear of not being liked, I'm kind of afraid, now I have to say the thing I need to say, but the truth matters more. That is blood-bought, and it's for your good. It's part of the promises of God that have found their yes in Jesus Christ. And my invitation to everyone here, especially if you're not a Christian, is there's a path of of being and living that comes in Christ that, that you can't even describe. It's so much easier to do these kind of things when you're a Christian because, my goodness gracious, if, if God has demonstrated his love towards you by sacrificing a perfect person on the cross for your messed upness and my messed upness, well then, you know, I guess it doesn't really matter if someone else likes me. No one can say anything worse about you than Jesus Christ died to save your rear end from hell. No one can say anything worse about you than that. And no one can say anything better about you than that. It works both ways. What, what uplifting word is better than that one? That something infinitely precious in value was sacrificed for you. There's nothing anybody could say that should give you more identity or more hope or more courage. Nothing. And there's no insult that comes close that, hey, you know what God had to do? That? There's no insult. And so it frees us from being people pleasers. It, frees us to live the truth of the gospel. And, and part of repenting and turning from your sin is actually saying, okay, because our sin is something that we actually perform. It, it is inside of us, but it actually is the thing that we, that we do as well. And you say, well, I'm going to turn from that way of being then. You know, I'm going to clean up my text message chat. I'm going to clean up some of this. I'm going to clean up this behind the back biting. I'm going to clean this up and, and choose to walk this way. And I'm going to make mistakes when I walk this way, but this is the way I'm walking right now. That's repentance. That's what that is. That's what it means to repent of your sin in a basic way. I know we don't like to be told that, but that's what it is. And we have faith that that Christ died for me and that this way is actually best. And so I'm gonna do it because my life will be better in Christ than it would outside of him now and later. Those are both true things and they are true things. It's not easier, but it's better. And those are different categories, easier and better, right? Right? He didn't promise us an easier life. He promised us a better one. And that means something. And we have to hold on to it. And so we repent of our sins when we choose the best path, the better life. We put our faith in Christ Jesus. We abandon self and we, we embody and embrace Christ. And if you haven't done that, you're not a Christian. My invitation is that you will. And if you have, the invitation is this. Let's walk in it. Let's all walk in it. Let's walk in it and learn from it and experience the redeeming power of yes and no. God, we thank you for your word and its ability to build us up. We pray that it would have its saving power, and we pray that it would have its sanctifying power this morning and in our lives, and we pray all this in Christ's name. Amen.